In my Standing Rock No Dakota Access Pipeline video, I covered some of the flaws and the lies in the mainstream narrative about the protest. The hypocrisy of the protesters was blatant. We rely on oil for our very survival. The Standing Rock chairman even owns a gas station, and all the protesters used oil products to travel to and from the protest sites. Rather than protest against the people who produce and deliver the oil, oil products we rely on, I support the development of alternatives. In the following, which I wrote six years ago, I suggested how the Cowlitz and Yakima tribes might partner to become a major supplier of electric energy from geothermal sources. Now, of course, anybody could do this, but in 2010, I was attempting to inspire the Cowlitz and Yakima to make an attempt at this starting with a fictional passage meant to illustrate how it might work. 2010 Olympia, Washington, prologue to power. Plant 7 is about to come online, the project manager observed. Few spectators showed up for these anymore, mostly tribal elders. He turned his attention back to the operations, where technicians busied themselves with last-minute checks. They were all used to the routine by now, and several were veterans of previous plant openings. The first of the two great geothermal grids started here in the Cascades in the foothills of Mount St. Helens. Now the seven plants stretched from Mount Baker to Mount Lassen. This feat had taken the combined effort of the 30 recognized tribes of Washington State, which now included the Chinook, the nine tribes of Oregon, and the Yurok in Northern California. Together, they formed a geothermal development corporation, an intertribal business that pooled the resources of the 40 tribes to work through the labyrinth of federal and state regulations and bring clean electrical energy to market. Resistance came from many quarters. On the left, environmentalists criticized the construction of the new grid, particularly since tribes had insisted upon using entrenched ultracapacitors rather than high-tension wires to deliver their electricity. But then, the environmental extremists always fought any th against anything they feared would help to sustain too many people. With worldwide fertility rates plummeting, however, it was now evident that the population was about to peak and would soon begin to fall, and so few paid attention any more to the wild-eyed profits of catastrophic overpopulation. On the right, corporate liberals criticized the tribes for overstepping states' rights and acting like they were above ordinary citizens. And by the way, when I speak of corporate liberals, what I mean are the right-wing progressives, the neoconservatives. The corporate liberals always fought against anything they felt posed a threat to the power and profits of the multinational corporations whose interests, knowingly or not, they served, especially where Indian tribes were concerned. But when the power flowed cheap, clean, and plentiful, nobody cared about that anymore, not even the corporate liberals. Existing power companies proved the most challenging, but they changed their minds after the intertribal corporation began to partner with them. So they didn't complain even when the tribes began to lobby for removal of all of the fish habitat destroying dams. So long as they had cheap electricity to sell, they were happy. Although all of the plants presented many challenges, the Mount St. Helens plant, the first to be built, proved to be the most difficult. The lessons learned there helped to smooth the way for the rest, which proved easier. And after the initial investments, the profits from each plant not only paid for the construction of each new plant, but provided a flow of funds to the tribes that eventually dwarfed the combined casino profits of the gaming tribes among them. That was years ago. Now, as the Mount Baker plant, plant number seven, came online, everybody knew it could be done without destroying the environment in a way that was respectful of the earth. And earlier this year, the intertribal company received government approval to begin construction of a new series of plants, a second grid that would draw off the heat of the Yellowstone National Park to provide electricity to an energy-hungry nation and potentially mitigate the volcanic hazard posed by the mega caldera. In effect, the Yellowstone grid would act like a giant radiator, cooling the underlying magma while producing electricity for the nation and profits for the tribe. And as they had done in the Cascades, they were partnering with local tribes and the local power and natural resource companies to do this. Is this our future?
The scenario above looks back from our potential future to view the work and success of an intertribal company formed by the tribes of the Cascade Mountain Range to develop the geothermal energy resources there. The account is fictional, but there are compelling reasons why we should make it a reality. If the 20th century belonged to big oil, the 21st will belong to big electricity. Breakthroughs in electrical energy storage are going to finally render internal combustion engines obsolete for many applications, including cars and boats. Consequently, the demand for electricity is going to skyrocket. Corporate liberals will use this to argue for more nuclear power plants. It's a proven, if costly, technology, but we're all familiar with the risks and hazards associated with nuclear. You would think that environmentalists would argue for wind farming, but the irony is that most support for wind farming comes from moderate center-left. What about wind? Environmental extremists oppose wind on the basis that it requires construction of new transmission grids, but their real motivation is that they oppose any buildup of energy production that would potentially support a larger population. They believe that a world population of about 2 billion people would be optimum, that it's the absolute maximum sustainable human population is about 5.1 billion people, and that without government intervention, the human population will rapidly exceed between 10 and 14 billion this century, that is, the 21st century. But according to Fred Pierce, author of The Coming Population Crash and Our Planet's Surprising Future, fertility rates all over the world are either slowing or, in many countries, even crashing. He writes that the world population will peak in the 2050s at about 8 billion and then will taper off to about 5 billion. That's less than the 7.5 billion people who are alive in 2016. The fading specter of overpopulation notwithstanding, what about wind? Many tribes are looking into wind farming. Many of us have attended a wind energy applications training symposium, and it's interesting. But while some tribes could possibly do very well with wind farming, there are some good wind resources on the Pacific coast and along the Cascade Mountain Range, as a general rule, most tribes in the Puget Sound region would not necessarily want to invest in large-scale wind farming at this time. The greatest wind resources are not along the Cascades, but in the Midwest. What we have here in greatest abundance is geothermal energy. Some tribes claim the Cascade Mountain Range as a part of our respective territories. It's part of the Cowlitz tribe's um, territory and part of the Yakima, too. And it's a tremendous source of geothermal energy. To develop that would require money, and only a few of those tribes have substantial gaming revenue. But were all the tribes of the Cascade Mountain Range to band together with the gaming tribes of Washington and Oregon to create an intertribal geothermal power corporation, we would have the resources necessary to start commercial development of the Cascade Mountain Range geothermal energy. Geothermal energy is free, clean, and abundant. Geothermal power development, however, is very expensive. Like oil, you have to drill for it. And like oil drilling, most of the wells come up dry. But once you find and tap the heat, the main costs are maintenance and transmission. There's no fuel, so once the plant is built and the power is flowing, the expenses are minimal. Next to drilling, the greatest challenges are the regulatory hurdles and the construction costs. For private corporations, the regulatory hurdles often prove insurmountable. Many geothermal hotspots lie on federal land, where they are protected from commercial development. As tribes, we exist sandwiched between states and the federal government, and our direct relationship with the federal government may prove invaluable to surmount regulatory obstacles to gain access to those geothermal resources. What kind of technologies would need to be used or developed? Well, most systems rely on hydrothermal energy, basically hot water. Two examples are the geothermal binary plant and geothermal integrated combined cycle units. There are many little hot springs scattered throughout the Cascade as well as in the Olympics to the west, and hydrothermal is the obvious route for any geothermal power plant to take. Most accessible geothermal energy, however, is contained in hot rocks. No water. 
A new technology to tap into that, and one I don't particularly like, is the Enhanced Geothermal System. Quoting from Wikipedia, quote, The vast majority of geothermal energy within drilling reach is in dry and non-porous rock. EGS technologies enhance and or create geothermal resources in this hot, dry rock through hydraulic stimulation by pumping high-pressure cold water down an injection well into the rock. Water travels through the fractures into the rock, capturing the heat of the rock until it is forced out of a second bore hole as very hot water, which is converted into electricity using either a steam turbine or a binary power plant system. All of the water now cooled is injected back into the ground to heat up again in a closed loop. Close quote. There are two reasons I don't care for this. The first is that it can potentially cause earthquakes like fracking does. The second is the potential for groundwater contamination. Injected water is not going to stay put. Some will seep out. Better, it seems to me, would be a closed system of heat exchange pipes that, like a giant radiator, would transfer the heat. This technology, however, remains to be developed. Another idea suggested by a friend is the Stirling engine, a heat engine that might be used in conjunction with geothermal to produce electricity. Most of these power plants would have to be built in remote locations, and getting the electricity to market would be a challenge. We've all seen the ugly, high-tension transmission cables that mar the landscape and flood the surrounding environment with electromagnetic radiation, but new technologies can make transmission lines far safer and more efficient, such as superconducting transmission lines and high-voltage direct current cables. Why should the Cascade Mountain Range tribes do this? The future promises a world of fewer people, but they will live longer, more productive lives, and they will want and demand even more electricity than is produced today. Geothermal can go far to meet this demand and do it cleanly. Private companies want to do this, but have no enduring interest in or obligation to the land and people here. The tribes do. Taking the opportunity to do this, the tribes, by working together, can assure that development of the power plants and transmission lines and their maintenance will serve both short-term goals and long-term needs while respecting the land, wildlife, and people. This would bring great benefit to the people served by the power plants and honor and profits to the tribes involved. It's a worthy un undertaking, one that warrants investigation at the very least. Sadly, jumping now to 2016, the present, no tribes seem interested in pursuing such productive endeavors. Most would rather protest against big oil than to actually do anything to usher in a new age of clean electricity. But maybe, just maybe, some evil white male oppressors, you know who you are, you know, the kind condemned by the sexist racist buffoons at MTV, might attempt something like this and yet again oppress women and minorities with more comfort and more prosperity.